to me, the value proposition, it, it all the points of value. From the minute a prospect enters your world, however they do, to becoming a client customer and beyond, where are all the points we provide value? Where do we teach? Where do we get them thinking in ways they haven't thought before? Where do we respond quickly? All the different ways we provide value. What are those points? And I'm telling you, the, the exercise of doing that uh, with an organization to figure all of that out is a great, it's a great process, first of all, because you and everyone engaged in that process and you really want to engage almost everybody in it. Uh, you really do get in touch with the value and you feel pretty darn good about it. And so that, that alone makes a big difference. Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang. Oh, man, we're going to have a great discussion today. Uh, and I can tell you also uh, that what we discuss here today is probably just a smidge of the insight uh, and really creative ideas and thinking and frameworks that you're going to get if you can continue uh, to follow up with Bill Gates. Bill, welcome. Hey, thank you. And just so they didn't mishear you, it's not Bill Gates. <laughs> uh, I missed that by one letter. A billion or two dollars, but <laughs> I, can, I can hear you. So Rimbach, sometimes people throw out, oh, hey, are you are you associated with Reebok? And I'm like, oh, no, I missed that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so Bill, Bill is the well, he's actually a author of many titles, uh, but the one we're going to focus in on today is Radical Relevance. And, and so we're going to talk about is why being more radical is the key to business growth. And we're going to talk about what we mean by radical and put that in proper context because we're, you know, as, 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 as I just said a second ago, it's not about, you know, getting naked and running through the streets. That's not the type of radical we're talking about. Um, and so we'll explain that here in a little bit. But Bill, in the book, you know, you talk about uh, something that I think all of us, you know, whether or not we're very uh, keen and and have the understanding of the actual statistics. But, you know, the reality of it is that we feel it, you know, personally, and that is that we're bombarded with more than 3,000 marketing messages each and every day. And it, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it from a, you know, a B2B marketing and sales perspective. You know, I would say 10 years ago, that probably wasn't as much of an issue, but today the world has massively changed. And so, you know, if I'm to sit there and say, well, you know what, all we have to do is just to create better and more stuff. Um, and that'll help us stand out. Um, then, you know, we will actually experience the growth that we want. What is wrong with that thinking? Well, first of all, do we know that it's actually 3000 messages a day? It depends on how you look at it and who's measuring what, but we know it's a lot, right? Um, and and see, the, what's happened with the internet, of course, it, the, the good and the bad, the good is that it's made it much easier for us to get our message out there. The bad is that it's made it much easier for us to get our messages out there. And so everybody's doing it. Uh, so the key is a couple of things. The, the main thing is that we have to be relevant, hence the title of the book, Radical Relevance. And, and relevance is not something that's new, right? From the first time anyone tried to influence anyone, they had to make it relevant, right? If you will do this and I will do this kind of thing, right? So that's not new, but because there's so many messages, the brain, and I know we're gonna talk a little later about little neuroscience stuff, but the brain's sorting all the time is do I pay attention, do I not pay attention? What do I pay attention to? There's too much coming at me and the brain doesn't wanna work. The brain likes to conserve calories. And so uh, it, it, if it's not relevant, then it gets ignored. And nobody wants to be ignored. So number one, it's got to be relevant so it catches their attention, You, whether it's for a couple of seconds. And then it's got to be compelling, meaning it, 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 it remains relevant, but then starts to dictate a possible path of action. 
And if we're not giving people a possible path of action, we're not compelling them, if you will, to move forward, then then they'll eventually forget, right? So you don't want to be ignored. You don't want to be forgotten. And that's about relevance and compelling. Well, and, and there's so many different things that you hit on there when you start, you know, thinking and talking about, you know, relevancy and then also, you know, the, the compelling and, and continual engagement, because one of the things that exists, you know, you know, for all of us is a timing, you know, element. Mm -hmm. Is it the right time? Uh, you know, we talk about different people within the marketplace in regards to, you know, are they problem aware, solution, solution aware, provider aware, oh, and all these types of things. Uh, and the studies show that maybe as little as 1% of organizations are actually at the point by which, you know, they're they're ready to make a decision. And so if I'm thinking about it, the marketplace, 99% of whatever I do is falling on inappropriate, you know, ears or eyes. So it's like, you know, how do, again, how do, if I start looking at that, that means I have a 99% failure rate. <laughs> how, how do I fix that? Yeah. So, um, actually in my book, uh, near the end of one of the last chapters, I detail this model that I learned from this guy named Michael, Sp uh, Scott, who's a venture capitalist in New England. And think about four quadrants, if you will, of, of our business, of our marketing message, uh, and the problems that our prospects face. They either know that it's, it's, uh, it, it's blatant, but uh, aspirational, meaning they know they have the problem, they know there's an issue, but it's not critical to them. It's aspirational. It's, yeah, I'll get to this at some point. Now, the other side, if you will, is, is that it's, it's latent and aspirational. That's the worst place to be. Latent and critical means they don't even know they have the problem, so we have to educate them. And the best place to be, and we can't always be there, but the best place to be is that quadrant where it's, we're uh, reaching people who have a blatant critical problem. And if we can find the market and our messaging that strikes that, then we're in pretty good shape because if it's critical, they'll move heaven and earth. It's like, gotta fix it. They're bleeding money, they're, there's a deadline, whatever it might be. And how do you move someone from aspirational to critical? Well, sometimes it's a matter of talking about the cost of doing nothing. And I hope that everyone listening, when you're with prospective clients and they're not sure when, how, in, in a very natural, non-pushy way, you can say, well, let, you know, let's examine. Yes, there is a cost, uh, if you will, an investment to moving forward to fix the problem. And, you know, I've outlined that for you a little bit here. And we, we should consider the cost of doing nothing. Let's see what that looks like, right? Or maybe you've already examined that with them, but that's, that's the choice they have to make. And if that doesn't tip them over into the critical spot of taking action, then either you got a bad prospect or maybe you just have to hang in there a little bit longer and be a little more persistent and appropriately persistent to, 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 to the point where they eventually do see the critical nature of moving forward. So. I hope that answers the question. That's always what I'm thinking. Are we addressing the right problem, and and do they know they have it? That's the sweet spot if we can get there. And we and we might come back and visit that because I have um, that was actually one of my um, notes that I wanted to ask, you know, towards the end because I thought it was a good wrapper. But we started with that, <laughs> so we're gonna come back. Uh, well, yeah, that's the question. What? I... <laughs> yeah, we're gonna yep. come back and yep. loop back around with that and hopefully close it up because. Um, there, there's another important statistic that's, that that um, talks about decision makers in organizations, and that um, a very high number, like you know, 96% of them say they're overwhelmed with all the messages that they get for their attention, uh, and then also 92% of those decision makers, uh, you know, choose to actually engage with and interact with and respond to respond to people uh, that they trust. Well, if I start putting all this in, into into play. If I'm just trying to do, you know, outreach and connection and things like that, there's no trust that exists there. So, I mean, how do I get that? Um, how does that actually, how does that insight impact our marketing and sales investment decisions? Yeah, no question. Trust is a big piece. Uh, you know, when people are examining um, who to go with, some of the questions they ask, there's always others, but, you know, it's, does this work? 
right? Well, does this solution actually work? So how do we demonstrate that? Well, that's the social proof sometimes. That's getting introduced by someone they trust, right? That's the borrowed trust that we need to leverage. Then the trust that can also come from testimonials, as my friend Rich used to call them, testimonials. Uh, that's the social proof. Uh, a lot of ways to demonstrate case studies, all that sort of stuff. So will it work? And then will it work for me? They want to know that too. Will it work for us? And so then having testimonials, case studies from within their industry, if at all possible. And let me give you a, just an aside note here is, you know, I, we all get this. I, I get a lot of messages to say, hey, you know, we'd love to be help you with this problem. We've worked for Microsoft and Google and, you know, and here I am a small business owner. Now I know that your listeners often go after the bigger sales, if you will, the bigger fish out there, but someone trying to reach me, a smaller fish, dro name dropping the big fish. Well, guess what? That's not relevant to me, right? In fact, it might even be off-putting because it may, I may think it's too expensive, right? If you're working for Google and Microsoft and IBM and this, well, what, you know, what do you got for me, right? So th that's another piece. So will it work? Will it work for me? And then <laughs> the, for my business and then for other business too, will I do it, right? Will we implement? Will we keep it going? Uh, that's sometimes in the thought process as well. So uh, almost whatever you're selling, whether it's a hard good, hard goods, if you will, tangible product or a service, we're in the evidence business. We have to provide evidence. And that's one of the ways we build trust. Now, the other part, real quick, is an important word, probably the most important word in, in marketing and sales, and that is empathy. Meaning in our messaging, as we talk about what we do on our website, LinkedIn profile, collateral material, voicemail message, email, whatever it is, they need to see themselves a little bit in that message. Maybe not completely, but they have to identify with how we're talking about our value and what we do. If they don't see themselves in that, if they don't start to identify with that, then they'll discount it and they'll probably ignore it. But if they see the relevance, the empathy, meaning we, we have a sense of their issue, we have a sense of their industry, we have a sense of their challenges, we have a sense of their opportunities, that's showing through in how we talk about what we do, then they're more likely to pay attention to it. And, and that's how we, one of the ways we cut through all the noise and, and build the trust, right? I, I think hope that helps. Important probably for us at this point, then, to, then to have you, in in your words, you know, define what is radical relevance. Sure. Well, a couple of ways to look at it. For me, look, and you're right. It's not radical to the point where you're, you know, uh, running through the streets naked. If you said, well, unless that's your thing, and by all means, go for it. Um, you know, if you want to have a boa constrictor around your neck, uh, go for it. But that's certainly not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is taking kind of a radical approach to getting to know your ideal clients or customers and digging deeper than what a lot of people do. Now, most people probably are familiar with the term avatar, persona. Um, that's in our lexicon these days, which is great. And the, the good news is we can have more than one persona or ideal client. We don't have to be limited to one, but being so clear on who, what that person is. And by the way, B2B sales, you're still selling the individuals. Okay. Never forget that, that when you're talking about what you're doing, how does what you do impact the organization, the B and the B2B, but also how does it impact that individual? and their role in the organization and what are what are their personal concerns about moving forward with a solution not just the corporate concerns right so you get to know them so well again how you talk about what you do they go ah they get us right and that's what gets the the relevance and starts to build the trust and so digging so deep into that having a clear target market you can have more than one target market. You can have more than one bullseye within the target, but th it's the clarity of all of that. And most people that I work with need to always, always revisit that, right? It's a continual revisiting of that. You can get it, you can nail it, you got it, 
good. It works. Some of the folks listening have that. More power to you. And sometimes that starts to fade a little over time or needs to change because the market changes or what you do changes. So hope that makes sense. Well, and I, and so I'm going to hone in on on a word that you use in a couple of different contexts that, uh, to me, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the platinum, you know, prize in all of this. And you talked about personal concerns and organizational or business concerns. And, and it, and it's and that concerns to me is I think where most people miss. It's not about, you know, y- your features and benefits. It's not about, you know, quite frankly, even, you know, your, your, that competition piece for evidence that, you know, that, that comes later, right? If we're not addressing the concerns piece, um, you know, th- there's no way we're going to do any standing out. There's no way we're going to do any connecting to get to the point to even talk about case studies. <laughs> Yeah, and and there's a couple ways to come about it too. It's we know that people in general are motivated by two things, right? Pain, pleasure, uh, removing pain, preventing pain, all that, right? That's the that's we know that about in business. So quite often our messages are structured around that. Uh, the other side, of course, is moving towards pleasure, happiness. That's the aspirational side, if you will, and the brain's looking for both, really. So what I tend to do is I, I I don't know exactly what I'm going to hit when I hit somebody with the message. Is it going to be the pain piece? Is it going to be solving the problem piece? Or maybe they feel like they they kind of know that, but but they want to focus on the aspirational side. What is it going to look like when the problem is solved? And those are obviously different sides of the same coin, right? Solve this problem, and then you can do this. Fix this, and then this becomes available to you, right? So I tend to focus on both. I, I usually will lead with the, you know, I understand your challenge or your challenges may be, you know, if you're like a lot of folks we work with, these are a couple of your key challenges. Now, when I'm on a phone with someone, there's different when you're writing it because he can't get the feedback. But if I'm on the phone or a Zoom or even an email exchange with someone, uh, I may run some challenges by them that I know my market and my target typically have, but I'm not going to totally assume that. That's a big mistake that we we make often is assuming. So I would say, you know, I know that a lot of folks in your industry or some of my other clients have expressed that this is their biggest challenge. Is that true for you? Now that may or may not be, but the fact that we know that and we know that about the industry and they know that about their industry, that's that empathy, right? That shows that we have at least some knowingness, awareness of their situation and that helps. That starts to build a little more trust. We gain a little more of their time. Um, so I like to focus a little bit on both and I don't really want to assume, you know, which here is true for you. Uh, and then that directs us into the right type of conversation. Gotcha. So, okay. So I'm looking here and and I'm, you know, trying to make sure talking about relevancy, uh, thinking about, you know, B2B high ticket sales, which most of our listeners, you know, are about, I mean, how, how does that differ from you know, business to consumer, where, you know, where are some of the common threads and also some of the, you know, the pitfalls that we have to make sure that we we don't step into? Yeah. So I think that the principles at hand don't change. Uh, I think the principles are really the same in the sense of uh, that, you know, solving the right problems, having the right messaging, getting to know who these people are, demonstrating that through our messaging. That's, that's, it's all really the same. I, I'd say the biggest pitfall that and we've kind of hit this already that some people make is ignoring in the B2B sale that there actually is that person there too. And let's go a little deeper in that because when we're, when we're talking with a, with a prospective buyer, you know, he or she is talking about the goals of the organization and what the organization has missed and measured and, and all that sort of thing. And, so they they usually take it off themselves and it's this bigger organizational picture and, and that's fine we do need to talk about that and when you step into the conversation and say you know that that's tom that's great uh i you know i think we can help you in that da, da, da. talk to me a little bit about your role in that and how that's impacting you oh man i'm under so much pressure 
right? I can't, I just wait to get these guys off my back or whatever they may say, right? Uh, it could be solve this problem and, and I get my promotion or whatever, but they have an interest here. They have fears, doubts, concerns, aspirations, the good stuff that are mixed up in that. And we really want to make sure we're addressing both. First of all, they usually appreciate that because it humanizes everything. And, and then maybe that's, that may be more important to them than the organizational aspect of what they want to call, uh, fix. So that's the biggest pitfall. Now, some of your folks probably know that they're good at it. So I'm maybe just reaffirming what you already know, but if you're not doing that, then you're really missing a huge opportunity and you may lose a sale to someone who has done that, who's gotten to know that person a little bit deeper than maybe you're taking the time and energy and sometimes courage to do. Yeah, well, actually, I think for what you're just saying right there in regards to how do, how do I take that and make it a little bit more tangible? But to me, I think part of that insight, um, well, not part, I mean, I think a, a large percentage of get, capturing that insight actually can be converted into what is your likelihood of closing, you know, that particular deal if it, it continues to progress. So, you know, if I make that- Oh yeah, w w without question. If I make that connection, that I mean, that has a higher percentage. Of course. And, and, and think about it this way, you know, I'm sure everyone in here knows the difference between a feature and a benefit. And you talk in terms of benefits, uh, let's assume that for a minute, because <laughs> some people do get stuck on that. But there's another step to it that a lot of people don't go to. And this is really part of that radical relevant side of thing. Um, and a, a colleague of mine, Joe Palumbo, calls it the benefit of the benefit. I like to call it the impact of the benefit. And so we may be talking about this, you know, this solution is going to save production time. Right, it's going to cut cut, uh, cut your production uh, time by by twenty percent. Wow, that's cool. So, what do you think that would look like on the floor of the manufacturing plant, right? And how how are your your workers going to react to that? And da 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 da. Right, you want them to kind of live into the benefit a little bit and talk to you, tell you back how they see it playing out. Because then they start to really buy into it and you're also learning a lot at the same time. And then you can go to the next step and say, and then, you know, what would that mean for you and, and, and your position? Is, does it change anything? Is it, is it, I assume it's a good thing, you know, tell me more, right? You can just kind of bumble your way into what does it mean to them? Oh man, I would be a hero, you know, if I could do that. Exactly. Let them, let them say that out loud to you, right? Uh, great. I'm in the hero making business. Let's get, let's move forward. Right? So, you know, it's, it's, that's a radical relevant part of this conversation. I think that a lot of people miss, um, I miss it sometimes. Sometimes I have to be reminded. I have to slap myself upside the head and say, I, I didn't go there where I should have gone. Right. Uh, we get caught up in what we're talking about and we feel excited about, and we know we can fix the problem, but we, we miss a key component that our competitor might not miss and <laughs> we want to make sure we hit it. Well, and, and part of that is, I think, you know, part in part of your 17 rules of radical relevance that you have in the book. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to put a link in your, on your show notes page, um, at b2bdm.com, um, and get people to that full list of 17. But if you think about those 17, what, which three are the absolute most critical and vital? Yeah, we've kind of alluded to these already, but let's make them more concrete. Great. So number one is the fastest way to relevance, the straightest line to relevance uh, with someone you don't know is an introduction by someone they know and they trust. Working the word of, world of referrals and even more importantly, introductions, uh, that's how we get on somebody's radar. That's how we're as relevant as we possibly can be with them. And so that's, that's the first one. And that's something I focused on for, you know, 30 years. Number, uh, the second one, I'll just go with number two, uh, is give your clients or customers a seat at the table. What I mean by that in relationship to this conversation is generally speaking, we don't want to work on our value proposition. We don't want to work on our messaging 
in a vacuum. We need to talk to some of our prospects and clients or customers. Uh, one of the things that I help in, in the consulting work that I do and, and working with clients is as we're working through value prop information and how and messaging, at some point we want to stop a little bit and and let's take this to a few of our key clients, customers, maybe some prospects with whom we have some pretty good relationships with already, and let's get their feedback on how we're talking about it. And I found, man, you you can learn so much uh, and and fine tune your messaging by talking to uh, to your folks, and that's. Often, as as people on this call will identify, uh, the difference between marketing and selling, right? The, the the marketing department creates all this stuff, and they don't always talk to the sales force, you know. And and, and within the sales force are the folks that have their, their their finger, if you will, on the pulse of what's really going on out there. And so it's got to be uh, marketing needs to talk to sales, and marketing and sales needs to talk to prospects and customers about the messaging. And I'll just give you one example. I was doing this with my own business and I was talking to one of my clients, Michael Schmitz out in San Mateo, California. And, and he says, you know, Bill, when I talk about you to others, what, what I say is that Bill Cates makes asking for referrals as natural as breathing. I go, wow, that's cool. I, I never would have thought of saying that, right? Uh, so our clients give us things, phrases, concepts, ways of looking at our business and communicating our value in ways we wouldn't think about. And I said to Michael, I said, can I use that? I'm going to quote you. And he says, yeah, by all means. Uh, so now I often use it. I have his picture there. I make it real, real tangible. Um, now, if I said that, I can make asking for referrals as natural as breathing. It's not bad. Sounds a little marketing hypey, right? But if I quote my client, I say, our clients tell us, or one of our clients said this. Now, it's, it's not marketing hype. I'm just quoting what somebody said. So taking this to our clients, customers, even prospects. Uh, I guess the last one I'd focus on is only differences that matter, matter. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that when we, a lot of, there's a lot of folks say, you gotta know what makes you different. You gotta know what makes you different. Well, it does help, especially if you're in a very competitive field and when you're at the bigger you know, sales arena, odds are that your prospect you know, they're considering a few different options. Uh, on the smaller level, uh, maybe not so much. But So we do need to know what makes us different. That's why we need to know our competitors. We need to know what we do, what our strengths and weaknesses. But with that said, how we talk about what makes us different only matters if it matters, if it's relevant to that prospect. And so I think it's... it. Uh, Unless you really, really know what's going on out there and you know your differentiating factor really is a differentiator that truly your prospective clients get and say, yes, I need that, then you got to be careful about hanging your hat on just one differentiator. I think sometimes it's a good idea to have two or three differentiators. Sometimes each one can be good and, and valuable to the prospective client. Sometimes it's the combination of the three. What we have to understand is that if your prospects can say it too, it's not a differentiator. It's a platitude. We care about our clients. We get to know our clients before we recommend, make a recommendation, all those types of things. We provide incredible customer service. Well, everybody's saying that. Uh, now, if you have a process that does that in a way that no one else can do it, and you can demonstrate that through the evidence that we talked about earlier, well, then maybe it is a really good, valuable differentiator. But just stating it without backing it up, it's not a differentiator. So remember, if everyone else is saying it or could say it, whether they do it as well as you or not, it's not really a differentiator. It's only valuable if it's relevant and true to the prospect to whom you're speaking. So those are three of the 17. How did I hit 17? I don't know. I guess I ran out of ideas when I hit 17, but that's <laughs> well, like I said, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I hear you. Well, what we'll do is we'll put a link to all of those on your show notes page. Now in the book, um, you actually present a, an approach uh, for digital markers that they can use in order to narrow their focus uh, in order to have greater success. And you talk about personas, client journey, content marketing, email marketing, and search engine optimization. 
And so for me, I'm like, okay, well, if everybody's doing that and everybody follows that, um, now how, how's that going to really help us stand out from the 3000 plus, whatever it is, marketing messages that we're getting, you know, getting bombarded with on it, on a, on a daily basis. Well, it, it, it goes back to what you're saying. I mean, we, we need to do all those things. Probably most businesses do anyway. Uh, we need to think about what's happening in the search engine. You know, we need to think about how we're employing social media, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, relevant messages and the right path on social media can actually create leads and, and create sales. Well, the times let's just part of that evidence and an awareness building. Well, I think in the book too, and maybe you can help me make the connection on this. Is that where you're talking about the eight principles of radical relevance, uh, and and how you actually go about doing? Oh, it? I see. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, it could be a dig in the digital realm, it, but it doesn't have to be in the digital realm. Um, so. In, in the book, I talk a little bit about my history and how I got started in all of this, uh, you know, 17 eons ago. And um, so I, I, in fact, I just found the book yesterday as I was doing a little rearranging in my office. Um, I was involved in the direct marketing industry and I was a member of the Direct Marketing Institute long before there was an internet. So all of the things we're talking about here, these principles, they, they've been around a lot longer than the internet has. And the internet, of course, is just another, it's just the medium. Um, and it's, but it's still direct response marketing. And so things like having the right market, having the right target, the, you know, the bullseye, the, the persona, um, solving the right problems, making the right offer at the right time through the right medium. Th those things have always been relevant to consider. And so, so let me give them to you real quick. Right market, right person, right problem, right product service, right offer, right medium, right timing, right messaging, right? And this, this, is, some, this is kind of a checklist we can use as we're building a program, a marketing sales initiative. Are we doing all of this properly? Best guess anyway. And then if after an initiative, it worked, didn't work, why did it work, why didn't it work, we can use that as a checklist, right? Maybe we should have been on LinkedIn, but we were on Facebook, or maybe we should have waited till the timing was better, or maybe we, we were talking about the wrong problem to solve, right? So you can use these principles to evaluate pre or post any marketing initiative you might take, and whether that's, whether digital is involved or not, and odds are these days digital will be involved. You, know, you talk about, you know, the principles and some of these foundational elements. And uh, I, th I think now, though, we're becoming more aware of how this act, why these things work. Um, and we look at, you know, the what you call the neuroscience of relevance. Um, so if, if you could, mm -hmm. you know, give us a little bit about what we need to know in regards to that neuroscience of relevance. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of things. I alluded to one already, which is that the that the brain, in its effort to keep the organism, the body alive, it wants to conserve energy. So conserve calories, just at a time when we might be at a place where we're trying to expend more calories because we put on the COVID nineteen, right? So knowing that. What it tells us is we better, better make sure that everything we do is crystal clear. Because if, if we're trying to make the brain guess at what our message is, it may ignore us. And this is where uh, you have to be a couple of things. First of all, you, you got to be careful about letting your creativity and cleverness get in the way of clarity. Look, I'm all for creative messaging and clever and, uh, you know, wordplay and that sort of thing. But if you know, in my, I have a colleague, Zamira Jones, he, he, he calls it the, uh, the billboard test. So you're driving down a highway and you read a billboard and then, you know, 20 seconds later, oh, I get what they're trying to say. Well, you've missed the exit, right? And so the message didn't have the impact. And so we've got to use concepts, words, principles that are already in the brains of our prospects and clients, 
and or, or customers, or, or we're gonna we're gonna miss it. The message isn't gonna be on target. So that's part of the clarity. Another piece of the clarity, there's a thing in 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 brain science they call cognitive fluency. Let me say that again: cognitive fluency. And essentially, if you look it up, you'll see what it means. It's it's we we got to make sure that we're very clear on what the path of moving forward with us looks like. This is part of the evidence business. It's also part of just saying step one in our process is this, step two is this, step three is this, then we'll decide should we work together and then we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this and outline and put it on your website, have a one sheet you can leave behind or send before in an email, but make sure that your prospective client knows what the path to working, to becoming a client and then working with you looks like and illustrate it, cognitive fluency. If, cause if you don't do that, and there's any confusion or uncertainty, they may not move forward or they'll move forward with the, with the person who did do that. I guess the last thing we've also touched on is that six times a second, the brain is scanning pretty fast, six times a second unconsciously. Where am I? Am I safe? That's about survival. And then three times a second, the brain is going, is there an opportunity? Food? Mate? you know, something, whatever it is, sunshine, warmth, cold. Um, and, and so we know that both of those are motivators. And we've talked about that, the, the solving the problem, the preventing the problem, and then the aspirational. The, so the brain is built for opportunity, but only when it feels safe. So that's why we need to include both in our messaging. And that's why in most cases, most People will lead with the, the the pain, the negative, the solve the problem type of thing. Look, that's why headlines that pull better for uh, blog posts and articles and 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 emails that they are you know avoid the ten problems, the five mistakes that people are making. The brain gets attracted to that because it wants to know, oh, am I making that mistake? Am I missing that opportunity? So. That's a little bit of how the brain plays a role in all of this. Well, and and I would dare to say that um, you know, there's a there's a, a slew of different factors associated with that. You know, e- even when you start even talking about you know the organization that I'm dealing with and their own internal cultures and buying process, and I mean, there's a whole slew of different factors that come into that. So oh, yeah, yeah. So if I think well, about there's the brains. That, there's the brain. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You go. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there, everybody's brain in the decision process is different, right? So if, if you're doing big sales, odds are you've gotten more than one contact at some point along the way, or the committee is going to review it or whatever. So the truth is we don't really, we don't know what's in their brains. And, and that's one reason why clarity is so important. And that's another reason why hitting the solving the right problems uh and and the aspirational both sides are important because we don't know what's exactly in the brain of each person so we've got to cover the bases a little bit uh and you know we can help solve this problem this problem this problem which is most important to you guys well five people on the committee they may all not agree and so we demonstrate and, and then eventually it comes down to the conversation, exploration, and finding out what it really is true for them. And then we hone in a little bit better. That's a good point. Okay. So now you also talk about, you know, getting, you know, radically, you know, focused and relevant in regards to creating that value proposition. Yes, you've talked about it a lot, but you actually talk about seven steps to a complete value proposition and you emphasize complete. You know, what, what about that is different than what we've heard before? Yes. Okay. So my take might be a little different. Um, a lot of people think value, they equate value proposition with elevator pitch. They equate value proposition with what I call a value positioning statement. So how the, 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 how we talk about our, uh, our value and clearly we do need some short ways to do it, some succinct ways to do it, depending on the medium and the time frame and the con- context. And sometimes we have more time to talk about it, so it can be a not not quite short message. To me, that's not the value proposition. To me, the value proposition, it, it all the points of value, from the minute a prospect enters your world, however they do, 
to becoming a client customer and beyond, where are all the points we provide value? Where do we teach? Where do we get them thinking in ways they haven't thought before? Where do we respond quickly? All the different ways we provide value. What are those points? And I'm telling you, the, the exercise of doing that uh, with an organization to figure all of that out is a great, it's a great process, first of all, because you and everyone engaged in that process and you really want to engage almost everybody in it. Uh, you really do get in touch with the value and you feel pretty darn good about it. And so that, that alone makes a big difference. And then we have this body of work of all the places we feel we provide value. Then the next step is going to clients, customers, possibly a few prospects, uh, that we have with whom we have great relationships and saying, this is what we've identified. How do these resonate with you? What do you see differently? What would you add? Where do you think we're not doing as well as we think we are in this area? Right. Uh, this could be one-on-one, -on -one, could be a focus group. And, uh, then that rounds out that full body of work that really is our value proposition. This is what we put out to people. Now, the next step is the value positioning statement, elevator pitch, whatever you want to call it, that draws from that and pulls from that. And it may pull in different ways for different contexts. I mean, when it comes to relevance, context is, is everything, right? Am I being relevant to the context? Uh, so that's another thing to complicate and consider around this. But that's what I mean when I mean value proposition and all the steps to, 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 to communicate that properly. And very few organizations go through that, unfortunately, uh, or they don't do it maybe enough. And I think it's the kind of thing maybe once a year you might want to visit. Uh, so everyone, first of all, it's, it's good internally just to get everybody kind of on the same page of understanding the value that we bring. You know what it's also going to do? into my other world around referrals and introductions and asking, it's going to make people feel more comfortable about leveraging this great value that we bring to get introduced to more people so that we can be instantly relevant with those people as well. So that's, that's how I see it different from the way a lot of people talk about it. Well, uh, uh, and so, you know, we've been sitting here and we've been talking about uh, essentially getting the opportunity to, to make the connection make an offer, um, have it be accepted, you know, whether it's sales service, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but when you look at some of the recent studies that have come out in regards to sales, uh, and uh, let's just say the failure of, of sales is that more than 50% of sales that are lost are lost due to no action being taken, uh, by the, by the company even when there may have been successful proofs of concept, right? So if, if I start, you know, looking and thinking about buyer fear um, is what they talk about being the issue, and it's called an omission bias, meaning that, hey, I don't want to make this decision and have it come back and bite me in the you-know-what, right? So it's, it's the fear of deciding um, and making the wrong decision. How can you know, radical relevance with what we've been talking about really impact the fact that most deals are lost to no action because of a mission bias. Yeah, and I'll put another word to it as well, just to round it out a little. Uh, it's inertia. Uh, one of the biggest ob ob objections, if you will, or roadblocks in, in our business and turning prospects into clients is inertia and meaning a body in motion tends to stay in motion. A body at rest tends to remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. So uh, using the word force carefully, we are that outside force that has to disrupt a little bit and get people thinking in ways they haven't thought before. This brings us back to, of course, what's the cost of doing nothing? And what's the negative consequence? The negative, we talked about the benefit of the benefit. What's the consequence of of the non <laughs> to make, make things confusing, um, to them and, and to the organization. So remember I talked about earlier, you know, does this work? Will it work for us? Will we do what it takes? Can you, will you do your part? 
because we've been let down in this area before, right? It's the evidence. A big part is the evidence. They've got, they, they see that other people have made the decision and have come out well. And that's a piece of that quote unquote outside force that acts on them. So it's, it's, it's the internal thing that we're doing. What's the cost of doing nothing, right? This is the consequence. And if they don't see it as critical, if there's not enough pain there, then, or they're not excited enough about the benefit, then they're not going to go there. And so, you know, the better we are at our jobs and getting to know them and explaining how what we do in a way that's relevant to them, the more likely that won't happen, but it does happen. Uh, and, and, and so then at, at some point we decide it, it is, do we keep this alive? Because sometimes timing is the issue, right? Whether we whether we think it is or not, on their side, they think it is. And that's kind of all that matters at the end of the day. And so then that's where the whole idea of professional persistence uh, takes part, and especially on the B2B side, right? Where uh, depending on what you're selling, it could take a long time for people to make a decision. And so then how do we stay in touch with folks in a relevant, compelling way without feeling like we're being pushy and they don't feel like we're being pushy and we're not just saying, hey, have you decided yet? Hey, have you decided yet? Hey, have you decided yet? <laughs> right? So that's a whole other conversation of, of that professional persistence that is also so important, especially on the B2B side. Oh, definitely. And then you also have your powers that be above you who are pushing to get that deal closed, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have it all, right? It's a welcome to the world. And, and look, it's not easy, but that's why we get paid well to do this, right? If, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And I, you know, Jim, as we're kind of closing, I know that it's interesting as salespeople, marketing folks, there, there's it's something interesting there because a lot of folks who are in sales and, and marketing, we kind of, we like approval. Like we like winning the sale. We like winning. We like uh, to have our value acknowledged. And yet we put ourselves in a position to be shot down pretty much every day, right? Psychiatrists have a field day with that. Um, and I think what it is, is we have a good, strong uh, ego state and we can handle being shot down in our effort to create the good stuff. That's my take anyway. Well, um, and it's a great take as well as a whole lot of insight that we haven't even covered you know, are in this book and I highly recommend Thank it you. being not just on your bookshelf, you know, but maybe on your side desk uh, so that you are actually actively using it and taking action. Bill Cates, um, how does the B2B DM gang get in touch with you? Well, uh, the book radical relevance book.com radical relevance book.com, a uh, little sh short, fun video there. You probably find interesting and then decide, um, and then uh, my website in general, referralcoach.com, referralcoach.com. Um, this is a big part what I talk about, the value thing, but you can see the books behind me if you're watching the video. Beyond referrals, referrals, get more referrals now, all of that side to it at referralcoach.com. So um, I look forward to engaging with you and, and seeing what makes sense. Bill Cates, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom, and we wish you the very best. Jim, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead. <laughs>